Ding dong! It's Zay. And this is episode 16, if I guess we'll do it that way. We left off last episode talking about the sidekick and how a script is structured. And surprise, surprise, that's what we're going to pick up today. I guess we'll do it that way as presented by Mama Bear Studios. Mama Bear's mission, say it with me guys, is to create entertaining works of art that explore our humanity. Okay, here's episode 16. Skagadoosh. Yo. Well, okay, so let's go back to the structure conversation, though. Sure. So I was saying 129 pages is too long. I think it's uh, – the main reason I'm saying that is because I know there are things that could be more eloquently or sort of elegantly – executed you know i think there are Mm. scenes that are three pages long that if i found a better way to convey the information visually as opposed to sort of doing exposition through dialogue that i could get beats sort of shorter but um and i think that would make for a better movie therefore my goal is to shorten it the other side is if i send the script to people and they see that it's 129 pages long they're gonna be like no flush it down the toilet well, yeah, or, you know, because I'm just not at that point. Now, if I'm the Coen brothers and they see a 129-page script, they're like, okay, whatever. They might be like, gosh, these guys, this script is too long. But what whatever. are they doing right now? Are they making anything? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I think they are. Let's look it up. Um, so, here, do you want to look it up while I blab on and on about scripts and stuff? Keep going. I got you. Um, so, but, John, basically what I'm trying to say is that there is – no sort of right or wrong way to do it and but i'm a very practical writer i like to i i I like to think about the process of making this and in some ways i i i think the sidekick could be a really great follow-up project to to rollers um because it is a small budget it's a it's an exciting kind of fresh story it's sort of a meta exploration of the whole superhero thing but it's also like really meaningful and kind of deep and um but anyway the in terms of the length and in the structure, I very much adhere to a school of thought, I guess, that says movies tend – good movies tend to hit certain beats at certain points. And that's not to say that they have to, and it's not to say that people don't break things open and do things that are super unique. Tarantino being a great example. And I think there are a lot of people who would say like – I would be like, well – what about like yeah like there needs to be a midpoint you know a midpoint is as you probably could expect about halfway through the movie there needs to be some sort of reversal like we we can't just like stay on the same boring trajectory the entire time like at some point twists of some kind need to happen and if it's a slow character driven drama that midpoint is going to be a little different than if it's like uh, an M. Night Shyamalan movie. Like, for instance, but, like in the yeah. love story, you know, the the two lovers are going to go meet at dinner, but for whatever reason they miss each other, and each, for whatever reason, thinks the other has abandoned the other. Yes. They go home devastated. Okay. Dot, dot, dot. Exactly. So that is a great moment. There's actually kind of a name for that, which... Mm. um. Some people would call that the all is lost mm. moment. Okay. And I then certainly it's followed. Would. Now, okay, so let me let me back up. Speaking of divisive, there's a guy named Blake Snyder. Blake Snyder is famous or infamous, depending on how you feel about Boo. it. Yeah, exactly. Boo. Blake Snyder wrote a book called Save the Cat. Save the Cat is also is is some people hate it, some people love it. I love Wish it. Wish I had that book I last week. <laughs> Is your cat dead? <laughs> Maybe, probably. <laughs> oh, boy, oh man. Hey man, it's, I hope she's alive. Ecclesiastes. We'll be sign fine. those shirts. We still haven't gotten the shirts. Printed. Ah, get another cat. Um, There's a million. By the way, here. quick reminder: if you haven't emailed me your address yet, you're running out of time. Has anyone emailed you? Yeah, I've gotten I've gotten some responses. How many? Mm, Less than five. Know, maybe sixty percent. Oh well, how many is that? I don't know, like eight. <laughs> <laughs> Not a lot. We didn't give away that many shirts. It's so um, true. So, how many boxes of shirts do you have, like under your bed right now? Well, I haven't ordered them. I'm not ordering too many. You know, oh, that's word. Why I've been waiting. Yeah, I'm trying to be. I'm a little stingy. There you go. Um, he wrote a book called. Uh, he wrote a book called Save the Cat. Save the Cat is famous for sort of breaking down 
uh, movies into a a very sort of understandable series of beats is kind of the the typical term. And he sure. didn't own the term beats, but that's a that's what he sort of. And so he talks about a lot of stuff and um and and but the thing that I would say that he's probably most famous for is this sort of I think it's fifteen beat structure, which is basically like an opening image, um theme stated which is an opening image is like what i told you where you know what i was reading like we're we set the scene we're in a there's a funeral something's amiss we've got superheroes in this world the town is shitty you know an opening image that like encompasses sort of a bit of the story right Mm. then you've got the scene the theme stated which i didn't read to you but that's at some point again all of this is somewhat flexible blake snyder part of the reason he's hated in some circles is that he would say the theme stated has to happen on page five period and I think that's dumb. But there is something to say that the theme does need to be very clear before page 15. You know, like, it doesn't have to be page 5, but it definitely needs to be happening somewhat so- soon, or else you're making an art house movie, and no one's going to know what kind of movie you're making. And if you're making an art house movie, then none of this is necessarily applicable. But if you're trying to make a movie that normal people are going to go see and have sort of a mental framework to understand... You kind of got to follow certain things. So I'll run through them really quick. Blake Snyder would say, theme stated, I might mess these up, but this is kind of how I think about it. And I could break these down, so stop me if you're curious, but but I'll probably just run through them really quick. Theme stated, page five, you should be hitting um, the theme stated. Inciting incident, which is basically like, Gadoosh, something big happens. In the sidekick, the, the superhero, Captain Steel, mm. the guy who is Jake's hopes and dreams, he's his ticket into the big time, he dies of a drug overdose, okay? okay? That is the inciting incident. World turned upside down. Everything goes to shit. Or, like, so let's say, or if it's like a rom-com, like you were saying, the meet cute, you know, like, oh, I bump into so-and-so, and all of a sudden I'm in love with a guy that I could never imagine myself being in love with, you know? Right. Yeah. Okay. Now, um, that kicks off a period of debate, which is basically like on the hero's journey, Joseph Campbell's are really famous. I'm really blown through this. We can have longer conversations about all these things. But Joseph Campbell is a famous author who wrote about the hero's journey. The debate, let's take Star Wars, a movie that a lot of people know. The debate is when Luke is like, ooh, should I stay on Tatooine or should I go and be a Jedi pilot? You know what I mean? Mm. And it's like, or, or, or uh, 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 he's not a Jedi pilot. He's a... Um, my, my brain's going in too many different he, you know what i'm saying um <clears throat> and in the joseph campbell model this is going from like the known to the unknown right yes yeah 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 i'm not quite as familiar with like the actual terminology that joseph campbell gives but yes and so luke is kind of like ooh should i go or should i stay he kind of knows what he wants he knows what his calling is but he's also like knows what his duties are mm. then there's a moment called the some people call it the break into two some people call it the first act break um there's different names for it but at a certain point the debate ends and the hero whether they're a traditional hero like luke or if they're um a non-traditional hero they to some extent at that point blake snyder would say exactly on page 25 but i think that's dumb but somewhere around there the hero needs to make a choice to actually choose the mission now that could be the point where the guy is like, oh, man, that girl is batshit crazy, but she's so great. And he's like, I'm going to go for it. I'm going to go against my best judgment. I'm going to date her. Or in Luke's case, he's like, I'm leaving. I got to go. And sometimes there's usually this – a lot of times there's this thing that forces that decision in some way. And, and there's a whole series of kind of mini beats that I could run through during that section. But for the sake of time, I'm just going to keep moving. So the break into two, the, 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 the basic structure – is there's act one, which just ended with the break into two. Does that make sense? Mm. Act one is kind of the setup. And then act two, and, and most people would say act one should be roughly 25 pages long. Act two, most people would say is about 50 pages long, but act two is usually split in two parts by the midpoint. So I call it act one, I call it act two A and act two B. Act two A is the beginning of this new world, this new mission, this new story, whether that's two people dating whether it's Luke going off and, you know, trying to join the, um, the, the rebel. Resistance, yeah. Yeah. Well, well, there's too many star Wars movies out now. And I can't remember which alliances or which, but, um, it's in, in, in Jake's case, it's, he decides I'm going to find out who killed captain steel in rollers. It's, I have a plan to save rollers. I'm going to execute on that plan. Mm-hmm. Despite the risks that may come. Then there's what's called as Blake Snyder would call it. 
the fun and game section, which is he calls this the promise of the premise. But this is basically like this is kind of the meat of the movie in a way. Like this is like where the montage happens, where it's mm-hmm. like, oh, we're da, da, da. you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah, we're we're going and like if it's lethal weapon, it's like, oh, we're like bopping around two mm-hmm. unlikely partners having fun, chasing down the criminals, blah, 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 blah. And then there's a lot of things that happen in there that make that a good section. And again, I think even movies like, say, Pulp Fiction, which is a complete... Well, you know what? I'm going to wait to talk about Pulp Fiction for a second. Let's get through the whole thing. All right. So then um, Fun and Games, you get to the midpoint. The midpoint is usually some sort of reversal. Now, there are a lot of different ways to do that depending on the type of story you're doing. Blake Snyder would say that it needs to happen exactly on page 55. And I'm like, that's dumb. But it should happen somewhere around there. You're starting to notice a theme. Uh-huh. And um, so, Blake, so the midpoint. The midpoint is typically some sort of, wow, we did it, but, or, um, oh, no, like we're totally screwed. But maybe there's a back door, you know, so there's always kind of this like reversal, like what you were saying. Um, It leads to some sort of next phase of the story, you know, Mm -hmm. like it's an evolution of the original plan. And so it's not like I'm going to walk from New York to Los Angeles. And then the whole movie is an uninterrupted story of you walking from New York to Los Angeles. At some point, something has to evolve in that overall mission. It can't just be the exact same thematic exploration the entire time without something evolving because otherwise how do your characters change, you know? And so the midpoint is main is kind of this major halfway point, turning point, evolution, and it can take a ton of different forms. But it usually leads to, as Blake Snyder would call it, there's a lot of other names for it, but Blake Snyder would call this bad guys close in, okay? Mm -hmm. There's this moment where it's like, ooh, people are getting closer. And so... The midpoint, I mean, the bad guys close in in a romantic comedy might be, oh, wow, so she really is kind of crazy, right? Mm -hmm. Or, oh, wow, she's starting to figure out who I really am. You know, if this is You've Got Mail. Oh, wow, like our businesses are directly competing, and all of a sudden they become aware of that to some extent, right? Mm -hmm. That typically leads to, um, and I'm skipping some stuff, but no one's going to remember this anyway, so it doesn't really matter. We get to the all is lost, the all is lost is when you fail. And and like you said, like he doesn't show up at the cafe. Um, the mentor dies or, you know, whatever. And then the all is lost. Like we are totally screwed. That's usually followed by a moment called the dark night of the soul, which is kind of what you described, right? Where we go off. We're, yeah, it's very descriptive. It's helpful in, a, in that way. But like we go off and we're sad and we're like contemplating whether or not we should just go home. You know, it's mm-hmm. just like, mm-hmm. and that, it, that takes many, many different forms because some comedies, let's take Dumb and Dumber. This is when the Dark Knight of the Soul is like, when <laughs> I'm trying to remember exactly, but like I, I would think of the Dark Knight of the Soul in Dumb and Dumber is like when Lloyd is like riding his shitty he realizes that he's been betrayed by Harry yeah. and his woman has been stolen and he's like riding his shitty moped up a mountain in Aspen. You know what I mean? And he's alone yeah. and it feels like everything's going to shit. Yeah. Okay. The Dark Knight of the Soul typically leads to some sort of revelation of some kind, some choice to retake up the mission, right? Mm-hmm. To reinstate kind of this original plan. And that moment is typically called the second act break or the break into three. And there are a lot of different forms that that can take. That leads to the basic overall kind of finale. Now, there's a whole bunch of sub beats that take place in the finale. But ultimately, what basically happens is that you storm the you you gather the troops, you storm the castle, um, you do all this stuff. Then you have one more moment of like, holy shit, total failure, some sort of twist, some sort of like, in in Dumb and Dumber, it's like Harry's tied. No, I'm sorry, Lloyd is tied up to the bed. You know, and um, he finds out that this woman will never love him. She says one in a million, and he says, so you're saying there's a chance. So there's a and chance. Then, <laughs> and then he's tied to the bed. The guy has the gun. He's about to shoot him. Harry runs in. Harry gets, you know, Harry gets shot, and all of a sudden you're like, holy shit, Harry's dead. That's kind of that moment where you're like, oh, no, I thought I failed before. Now I really failed. Another totally famous, effed. Another very famous example of what you called storming the castle from – princess bride when billy crystal says we're storming the castle yeah exactly that's a i mean that's precisely 
what that is. It's right. been, and he, and, but first, he has to gather the troops. He has to go and he has to get Inigo Montoya mm-hmm. and sober him up by dunking his head in the water in one of the most hilarious scenes of all time. And they have to go get um, – they have to go get – I'll shoot. What's his name? Um, Carrie Elwes's character. What's his freaking character's name? The beautiful guy. The, 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 the main character. Who? Wesley? Wesley. Yeah, sorry. I was blanking on his name. They have to go get him, and he's sick because he's been like in the torture chamber thing. You know that like, guy they have to bring him back to life. <laughs> that guy was before in the they can Saw movies. The castle. Carrie, yeah, Carrie that, Elwes. Yeah, he's in like every single Saw movie. Ah, oh, good for him. Yeah, those are his like two credits. I, I met his brother a couple times. His brother's a pretty big time producer. Really? Uh, yeah, he's a good dude. Um, so then we storm the castle, then we win, then there's some sort of closing image. There's a million things that I'm skipping over, but that's basically the structure. I would say this is where it gets divisive, but I would say almost every single Hollywood movie ever adheres to that structure in some form. Even movies like Adaptation, speaking of the, okay, the I was spikes, gonna in bring... this case, Jones. Yeah, go ahead. Well, I was going to bring up Adaptation because it, a lot of that movie deals with the script writing process. Yes, exactly. And it's a good movie for anybody who's curious about it to watch. Um, and in fact, they have he has a character in there that sounds a lot like the guy that you keep. What's his name? The the guy who wrote the book, Save the Cat? Uh, Blake Snyder. Yeah, that guy <laughs> I think Snyder. is... I can't remember off the top of my head. It's either based on Robert McKee or it is Robert McKee. Oh. I, he, I can't remember, but I think it's based on a guy named uh, that who, who wrote a book called Story or something like that. Anyway, sort there's of a it. number of different sort of script gurus out there. There's Robert McKee. There's Sid Field. There's Blake Snyder. Um, there's, Joseph Campbell is sort of an older guy who didn't necessarily talk about scripts. He was talking more general sense about the hero's journey. But anyway. But in uh, adaptation itself, it's kind of interesting slash funny. He, he, there is a guy in there who goes to a script writing class and the movie itself, it's sort of a meta joke. There is some voiceover going on while a screenwriting guru is telling the character who's trying to write a script that that voiceover is lazy, terrible writing and to never what does he use say? it. He, he says, and so help me God. If you yeah. were, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it's really good. It's a great movie. Um, that's a great, okay. So that's a great movie where in every way, he is exploring and upending traditional expectations for sure. story structure. And yet it adheres to these beats in uh, to an almost shocking degree. And the reason for that, the reason that's possible is because he's doing it in such an elegant, such a, a an advanced sort of creative, I would say even genius way that you're completely unaware of them taking place. And so I think that's where a lot of people are like, well, what about this? What about this? What about Chinatown? What about like, um, you know, what about Pulp Fiction? Pulp Fiction doesn't follow a linear narrative at all. It jumps all over time, blah, 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 blah. But I'm saying I don't that's care not about even really that accurate. I mean, it is. It's told in a nonlinear form. It's told in a nonlinear form, but the actual story arc follows this exactly. Exactly. That's what I'm saying. And so I think people who are willing to admit it would say, yeah, like like one that I really love to point to and, and Dan Jacobs, who was part of Mama Bear for a long time and still is. But he, one of his favorite movies is Children of Men. And that movie's long. It's kind of all over the place. But you can totally follow the structure according to this the same the same beat pattern. And again, the better the artist, it ve- it can be very difficult to sort of see these things happening. But I would say part of what's so great about following a structure like this is that you don't have to reinvent the wheel constantly. And so you can spend more time hiding the structure. You can spend more time exploring the characters and making it all kind of this unique intertwined thing as opposed to what I think ultimately makes Blake Snyder controversial, which is that it's a very paint-by-numbers philosophy and i don't even know if that's what he set out to do i think a a lot of people use it that way where they're like anyone can write a script just follow this format and i would say yeah anyone can write a script and in in some ways i think part of the reason i'm loyal to this process is because i never would have written my first script had i not had it broken down in this way Mm -hmm. because i was like well where do how do i start you know like what how do i go from zero pages to 100 pages and the truth is you don't 
you know, you 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 lay out an outline, and and we should just do a whole other episode on this because there's so much to talk about. But like, you lay out an outline. You you just have to get from point A to point B. You play. We you know, I'm teaching a a, a bunch of middle and high schoolers with my friend Bryce. We're we're teaching like a film class once a week. Hmm. And where? Um, it's it's called Amp Studios. It's this really cool nonprofit that's part of our church that basically teaches filmmaking to kids in Highland Park, which is a neighborhood um, east of east of L.A. And any in East LA, it's not East of LA. And so we're just teaching them about stories and, and we're talking about a lot of this kind of stuff. And it's like, you don't have to reinvent everything, you know, because the truth is what I realized, I think I resisted this for a while, but then the better my stories got, the more they started to feel like movies, the more that I eventually sort of just settled into some of these beats and realized like, you know what, these are my friend. They're not hurting me because I'm not writing some experimental novel. You know, yeah, like I would. I, I, I gotta hit some beats. Like I got, it's gotta feel like a movie. You I know? would immediately just be, probably because of my personality. But if I were gonna make a movie, I would immediately think about how to turn that on its head. I agree, but in some ways, it follows this this classic th- theory of like you got to know the rules to break them. Sure, you okay. know, and yeah. and I always tell people when we're doing development with other people who are like, well, I don't follow that. This happens all the time. Oh, I don't do that. I do my own thing. I'm like, okay, well, sort of, but also I'm reading your script right now, and the worst parts are the ones where you're lingering way, 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 way too long on some unimportant thing. And I'm not saying that because of any sort of loyalty to the system. I'm just telling you that's how it's reading. And so I think there's a there's a sense of like, yeah, like if you're Tarantino and you can turn it on its head while still making a really exciting movie that makes a ton of sense, that's great. But ultimately – you're probably going to, if you're making a movie, you're probably, and it's not like an experimental art movie, then you're probably going to hit some of these beats. So you might as well start with that in mind and spend more of your time upending them from within the system, as opposed to just throwing the system out the window from day one. Yeah. Yeah, I guess so. But it's I'm, totally okay to feel differently about that too. Well, it's just if it does feel a little weird. I completely understand the idea of having a structure that works and that is familiar. Um, it just feels a little stifling. Although I guess you know how how many pieces of great art are on a rectangular canvas? Most That's of most of them. Such a great comparison. Da da! Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I'll be here next week. Right, like if you're going to paint a portrait, you can do a portrait like Picasso did a portrait where he's like, I'm going to completely upend, upend your expectations of a portrait. And yet it wouldn't be called a portrait if there weren't certain common elements with the Mona Lisa. Sure. Mm-hmm. You know, and that doesn't make it less creative. If anything, I'm actually very intrigued by the idea that some of the greatest artists are able to work within those confines and then still – make something completely unique. Yeah. No, definitely. Um, and I, and, and I despise modern art, sort of, so... Yeah. Well, hey. <laughs> I mean, it's not to say that Roller just sort of follows these rote beats. I mean, if anything, I got that out of my system. You know, I, I sort of just, like, used it as a, as a jumping-off point, but then immediately was constantly looking for ways to deepen these beats and to do them in a way that you're not expecting. Because I would say... If you're watching a movie and thinking intentionally the whole time about the structure, then the person who made the movie failed. Mm. Mm -hmm. Um, And that's why I'm like, yeah, like, okay, let's like let's go deeper. Let's use these beats. You know, some of my favorite movies are Pixar movies, and they famously some people think that they're stuck in a rut, and I think right now they're a little bit in a rut. But at the same time. Um, Did they lose that Lasseter guy? Yeah, he's gone. Yeah, Ooh, for Me Too baby. stuff. Ouch. But you know what? A lot of people say he wasn't really like the – the he, he kind of ran his course. And like a lot of people say that like Pete Doctor and a lot of these other younger guys, they're not really that young anymore. But a lot of these other guys that came up are really kind of the ones bringing the heat these days anyway. But I mean Coco is a terrific movie. But all of these movies – I don't get that bored with them just because they follow these beats because ultimately I'm so invested in these characters and these stories that I'm not thinking about the beats. I'm following the story. You know, like they manage to be surprising and unexpected and unique in spite of the fact that it's a relatively traditional story. I mean, you like Indiana Jones. Indiana Jones is in every way 
uh, adherent adheres oh, to these beats. Doubt. Yeah, I'm kind of. But when you're watching my... Indiana Jones, it's so excellently executed that you're not worried about the fact that it's hitting the beats because you're just following the story. You're just in it. You know? Right. Right. I, I mean, I'm trying to think of a movie that that breaks this that is well known and has a narrative structure i mean you know we've all seen like art house movies mm-hmm. obviously that's not the same but thing. like a commercial movie what about like 2001 a space odyssey there is oh 100 percent follows the structure there is definitely some idea of um you know like maybe more joseph campbell mythology type stuff but mm-hmm. but like there are so few beats hit in that movie <sighs> Yeah, I mean, he's certainly experimenting, and and I would even say that 2001 is right on the border of an art house movie, but they're still all the same things. I mean, the theme stated right at the beginning with this image of this obelisk thing, and or not the obelisk, but the monolith, um, this black thing is sort of like progress and humanity and, well, not really humanity because it's about monkeys, but still, you know what I'm saying? Like, it's about, it's setting the stage, and then... The moment when he's floating outside and Hal says, I'm sorry, so-and-so, I can't do that. Dave, That's a classic... everybody just screamed that was listening to Dave. Know, sorry. Dave. I just saw this in 70 millimeter at the Arclight. I should Oh, did that, you really? I'm sorry. Oh, man. That's sick, dude. It I'd was love to see that. a stunning experience. I mean, I don't know that I've ever had a better theater going experience in my life. I was mm. almost crying. It was so... Oh, you know, and it, well, part of what was cool is that it was an original print that had been restored. So it was like there were like some scratches and it was kind of grainy. And you're like, whoa, there's like a direct connection, an unbroken connection between me right now in this theater mm. and the original film that was shot. And I mean, man, we could do a whole episode on 2001 because it was shocking. The, the visual effects in no way felt dated whatsoever right yeah that i've seen it relatively recently i think i tried to show it to one of my kids didn't go over Ooh, great I uh, <laughs> <laughs> you like space <laughs> try this three-hour movie uh, um no but i would say like that moment when he's like i'm sorry dave i can't do that yeah that's a great example of uh you know i can't remember what minute it happens at but that's a classic like all is lost 400 one, you know yeah, and then the finale is kind of like him going into this abyss, um, and and I don't know. I mean, it's it's very experimental. It's very different, but it really does still kind of hit some of these beats. Not I don't on a certain page count, but I'm uh, not exactly sure what Stan thought. But I know that, you know the book is. Um, oh, and I can't remember. The, I'm totally blanking on the guy's name who wrote that book. But um, the obelisk is alien technology. They send this craft out into the universe, and that's why when the monkeys touch it, the next scene is fast forward to human evolu- – like human e's- uh, humans having evolved rapidly to space Well, there age. is one scene though, but there is one scene between when they touch it. The next thing that happens is after they touch it, the, the, sure, they the, start using the tools. chimp – yeah, the chimp right. figures out that he can use a bone to break things. Right. So the the idea, at least in the book, and it seems obvious that it's in the movie too, is that the obelisk is advancing life on Earth. Yeah, but that's a classic inciting incident type situation. And I would say that probably the inciting incident is not the the chimps finding it. That's more of a thematic exploration. But the but the is it the moon where they find it? The yeah. the humans finding the monolith. That is a classic inciting incident. It's like nothing will ever be the same now. Mm-hmm, right. This is a new world. You and know? they, they, they don't do know. debate They it. have no idea what that means. But, oh, yeah, there's a debate. What right. are we doing? All right. I stand corrected. 2001 no, okay. follows I mean, I'm not trying to win. Exactly. I'm just saying like – No, no, no. Well, you're right though. It, that. It, it doesn't does follow, follow exactly. It. But, but, it, let's, but again, back to the controversial thing. It does not say page 15, this has to happen right. on page 15. Now, if you're writing a big studio spec script, sure, maybe try to hit the try to hit the beats pretty exactly. But I would say, yeah, it, it's it's very flexible. Um, but at the end of the day, it's flexible within. To your point, I think that's a really great way to sort of capture it. Is think of how many great pieces of art have taken place have have been made on a rectangular canvas. I think that's a great way to look at it. It, it it's a limitation, but that's also that limitation is also part of what frees you to explore within and go deeper as opposed to broader, you know? Mm. That's true. I don't know. This is, uh, this has been good, John. I feel like we, all we did was sort of scratch the surface, but maybe we should do just another episode next week talking about 
<clears throat> sort of some of the specifics of this. I mean, we could go through some movies mm. that everyone will know. We could we could talk about um I mean, I could talk about sort of some specific examples. I don't know. We we can think about it. But Mulholland Drive, David here. Lynch. There's no way David Lynch, maybe Blue Velvet, but I'm going to watch Mulholland Drive over the weekend. There's no okay. there is no flipping way that movie follows any sort of structure. Have you ever seen it? Uh yeah, but it's been a while, so I couldn't like make that argument. Uh, ladies and gentlemen out there, go watch that movie. It's okay. uh, it's a trip. We'll talk about it. I would be willing to bet money without remembering the plot very well. Yeah, that there are some pretty structural like elements going on. Okay, let's watch it. If, okay, if we, we if will. there's anything to talk about, we'll sort it out. Okay, I think that's fair. But like, you're a Fellini fan. I love Fellini. Now, there are going to be people who are like, "You're wrong." But like, dude, for real, that guy is totally upending expectations. He's totally experimenting. He's totally doing things, but he's doing it from. He's still referencing and still bouncing off of and evolving out of a basic structure. You know, there's a basic narrative structure that he is following, and to some extent his movies are adherent to that and he's a he's a great he's he's an absolute like stone cold master and i think it would be very very difficult to argue that a movie like eight and a half is lacking in structure oh for sure actually you bears know? a lot of similarities to the movie adaptation thematically at totally. least totally well, and, and in the sense that that's a whole other thing. There's a million different kinds of genres, and I would say that one subgenre is a subgenre of a subgenre. Maybe is the the sort of meta exploration of creation of art, you know. And mm-hmm. I think Eight and a Half is an example of that. Specifically, the creation of movies, you know. Mm-hmm. But like, I think Eight and a Half is an example of that. Adaptation is an example of that. Birdman is an example of that. There's a there's a Day for Night, which is a, a Francois Truffaut movie that's just an absolute pleasure to watch. Is it's an example of that. Like it's it, there's a long tradition of people making movies about making movies mm-hmm. because um, as we can talk about next week. I mean, I would love to even share some of like my sort of personal failures, experiences, journey, whatever with writing certain scripts and and uh, the structural elements of that are going to play into that the right. stories you know but anyway well um we should wrap it up um john what do you what's uh what's new with you oh man what's not new Fortnite. for dude <laughs> did i tell you about the skunk john no oh my not God. yet you haven't well i'm getting man i'm like triggering myself it was so traumatic our um so apparently there's a lot of skunks in this area. Sure. You know? And you know I'm not afraid of stinks, stinkies, stinky things. I, I just stink, imagine stink now here. that weed is legal in California, the entire state smells like a skunk. You know, my wife just the other day was like, ew, you smell that skunk? I was like, nah, babe. That's, that's some dank weed. That's Cali Gold right there. <laughs> that's some real dank weed, girl. Um, No, okay, so the other night, it's, I don't know, maybe 3 a.m., right? And I wake up in like a cold sweat. Uh oh. And I'm just overwhelmed by the most heinous stench I've ever smelled. And I've smelled a skunk many, many, many times, right? Because you, you smell them on the road. They get hit or they just spray something. You know, you smell them in passing. But my whole bedroom was just completely overwhelmed by the stench of skunk spray. And I didn't know what was going on. But what was so weird about it is, you know, like garbage yeah. or other sort of more organic smells, they almost have like a sweetness to them and you can kind of get used to it. Like if you're around it long enough, it kind of just like it starts to fade and it mm. gets to be less gross. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Okay. Skunk smell has like a, like spicy food. It has like a cumulative effect. It was so... I was so nauseous, nauseated. I was just completely overwhelmed. And it wasn't because I was even like, ew, this stinks. I was like, I'm going to puke. Like, it was like chemical warfare. I mean, it was so – and Kelly, of course, was awake. And so we look out the window, and our downstairs neighbor, they're spraying their dog down. Apparently, this is the second time it's happened. He, like, found a skunk in our courtyard and just Uh. got sprayed. But this is how strong the smell was. 
They were spraying him down about 20 feet away from our window, mm. and our entire apartment smelled overwhelmingly of stunk, skunk. The whole hallway, which the dog never set foot in, smelled yeah. entirely of skunk. The front courtyard smelled of skunk. They're just spraying that funk all over the town. No, dude. It was just – it was – and it's this, like, real messy, oily stuff that's, like, really hard to get out of stuff. Anyway, so we're up just, like – we have no idea what to do. I set, like, a like a little air diffuser with, like, some essential oils in it, and it kind of sort of helped, but it uh-huh. didn't really. And then I couldn't sleep. It was 4 in the morning. I'm laying there 30 minutes in. I'm about to puke. I can't do it. I'm like, I got to do something. So I put on, like, a little medit- – I have this little meditation app, mm. <laughs> and I put it on. I was like, maybe this will help me sleep. And I'm laying there, and I'm just like, I'm going to – throw up this is so bad and she's like okay now focus on the breath focus <laughs> on your <laughs> and i'm like, oh. <laughs> like literally i'm like i don't know what to do because the only way i know how to get to sleep is meditate but she's telling me to focus on my breath and every time i breathe in it smells like skunk it That's- was really rough it took about an hour for for it to and the whole next day the apartment still smelled it was kind of incredible kind of insane that it's horrifying you got to use tomato juice it neutralizes whatever chemicals in the is that real or is that an urban myth i think it's real i mean mm-hmm. i think there's other possibly better stuff like put baking mm-hmm. soda in a solution you know but you gotta mm-hmm. uh neutralize that chemical yeah. um anyway eesh, it's it's sickening i mean i heard recently that there's been some it's literally chemical warfare yeah there there has been been some research done about political parties that depending on your response to revulsion Mm. so if you like encounter something that is really stinky or Mm -hmm. (laughs) dirty they have seen like a correlation between which political party you uh affiliate with yeah and the there is a whole bunch of uh thinking behind it but it's pretty fascinating field look it up folks yeah, that's really interesting. I mean, that's the whole thing, though, that was so surprising about it is I'm not – and Kelly's a nurse. I mean, she deals with hideous stuff all the time. Right. And we were both just overwhelmed. I mean, it was not – like, I, I'm not at all – I'm not squeamish. You know, mm. I can deal with some gross stuff, but it was it, – it's like it was designed to trigger something in my brain that was involuntary. You know, Right. Get out of here. It was insane. Mm. Um. Anyway, well, on that note – Let's hope we haven't repulsed all of our listeners. Oh, this podcast is the uh, skunks, skunk smell of podcast, baby. Exactly. Um, all right, John, well, we'll talk soon. Love you, bro. I talk soon. Bye. Bye. Thank you for tuning. <clears throat> Thanks for t- <clears throat> Sorry. <clears throat> Thanks for tuning in for part two of two guys sitting around with typewriters saying some words and stuff. Join us next Friday for our next ep, not Tuesday. Today's show was produced by moi and edited as well. Executive producer John Schimpf. Intro music. That funktastic song is "The Get Down" by Summer Dregs. Outro music is "The Man from Nowhere" by Tom Paulus and Max Bells. Our cover art was designed by Nate G. O. Don. No. This has been a production of Mama Bear Street. I'm in nowhere, feeling the heat of the desert air. The journey is all I know. It's your boy.